this morning, we will pick up um, from where we left off yesterday. So we talked about strategic leadership. We talked about civil military relations in, on the African continent. And this morning, we'll pick up on that discussion and move further with it by talking about enhancing professionalism in Africa's security sector. Um, so ultimately, we know that the professionalism of the security services and citizens' perceptions of the security services hinge on having a system of checks and balances that ensures everyone respects civil liberties, human rights, and rule of law. We talked a bit already um, over the course of the program and in our discussion groups about how formal national level oversight institutions, so things like parliaments, which we spoke about yesterday, inspectorates, military ombuds institutions, independent commissions uh, for anti-corruption or human rights can all play a role um, in monitoring security force activities and behaviors towards citizens, but also these everyday practices that you as security sector leaders that officials exercise with citizens may also matter in, in, in uh, uh, developing um, you know, uh, the strong trust that we hope um, military professionalism helps inculcate with the populace. Um, so um, you know, I think most African security sector professionals, um, we know from this study that's been on the table um, out um, on the research uh, publications table with us. Um, it shows, it's written by uh, Dr. Kwesi Anning, who's with us today. It shows that uh, most African security sector professionals are satisfied with their profession. They have a strong sense of pride in embracing the values of professionalism, um, such as duty, responsibility, respect, and honesty. Um, so this survey, if you haven't read it, is a very interesting survey um, of, uh, people in the security sector in many countries in Africa and how they feel about that. Um, but as we talked about, there's also a somewhat bleak status of professionalism, notwithstanding because some militaries, uh, because of the, the rise in recent military coups that we've started talking about. So uh, nevertheless, we've seen other examples on the continent where um, the security services have exhibited notable levels of professionalism during political transitions, during elections, during protest. Um, and have, who have upheld the rule of law and respected the constitution and the will of the people. So today um, in this plenary session, we have more opportunity to go into the deep, more deep uh, discussion of professionalism, what it is, uh, what are the principles behind it? What are the trends on the continent and what can young security sector leaders like yourself do to advance it? Um, so for that, we're joined by two distinguished experts. Um, one who many of you know well here now, one of our facilitators, um, an adjunct professor of practice here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, Dr. Emil Wedrogo. Um, he specializes in issues related to national security strategy development and security sector reform and governance. Since 2007, he has worked with the Africa Center on more than 60 different activities as a speaker, facilitator, and author. Um, and I believe you started out in this program long ago, right, Emil? So he's also an alum of this particular Emerging Security Sector Leaders um, program. Prior to joining the Africa Center, Dr. Wedrogo completed a six-month mission with the AU in 2017 as a security sector reform and governance expert for Madagascar. He is currently a senior expert consultant for the UN in Mali and also an international expert in the DRC for the Dutch project entitled Just Futures. He was a Minister of Security of Burkina Faso from 2008 to 2011. He initiated and developed in that capacity a homeland security strategy and operationalized the concept of community policing and community participation in the management of security issues in his country. After 32 years of service with the Burkina Faso Army, he retired from active duty in 2012 as a colonel, having served in positions including aide-de-camp to the prime minister, Support Regiment Commanding Officer, uh, Infantry Commando Regiment Commanding Officer, and Chief of Military Intelligence. Dr. Wadrogo also very notably was a parliamentarian in the National Assembly of Burkina Faso and the ECOWAS Parliament. Uh, so Dr. Emil, welcome to the podium. You've, he's been on the podium here before, but uh, we're looking forward to um, your, your presentation to us today. Um, I don't have it with me, but Dr. Emil also has a publication that looks much like this. You have it? <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Called Advancing Military Professionalism in Africa. Um, he wrote it for the Africa Center a while back in 2014, so he'll be giving us an updated um, set of thoughts about it, uh, but based on that report, which is a classic here at the Africa Center. 
We also have with us online, uh, Dr. Kwesi Anning. Dr. Kwesi, welcome. He is full professor and director um, in the Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training, Training Center. Center. He's, He's also, also a professor, professor at the Nordic, Nordic African, African Institute, Institute and, and Uppsala, Uppsala University. University. He, he served, served as the AU's, AU's first expert on counterterrorism from 2005 to 2007. And in 2006 and 2014, he wrote the independent midterm in-depth evaluation of the global program on strengthening the legal regime against terrorism. And in 2008, he was the author of the UN Secretary General's report on the African Union relating to peace and security for the UN Security Council. Um, more recently, until January 2019, he served on the UN Secretary General's advisory group for the Peace Building Fund. And he specializes overall in peacekeeping economies, hybrid security and political orders, democratic transitions, and in governance processes, as well as organized crime. Um, so a wide range of expertise of the two people we have here speaking to us today. All right, so here's how uh, we will proceed. Um, we hope that uh, first Dr. Emil will give a presentation, 15 to 20 minutes, followed by Dr. Anning, 15 to 20 minutes, Dr. Emil will start us off based on his uh, report that he wrote for the Africa Center, talking about what the concept of military professionalism is and talk, and talk about, about what are some of the key principles guiding it. Um, then he will speak a bit about the surge of coups and increased military intrusion into politics, um, assessing sort of why this has happened, what the status and the trend of professionalism is in light of this trend, and what he thinks some of the lessons learned are for those of us in the room. Um, so, so for security, security sector, sector leaders, leaders um, how, how can, can specifically national security strategy development, which he specializes in, help, help to advance, advance military professionalism? professionalism. So, so Emil, Emil will, will talk us through that. that. Then, then we'll move, move to, to Dr. Anning, who will also talk, talk about the status, status and trend of professionalism in African, African security, security sectors in light, in light of, of the evolving nature, nature of security challenges in Africa. He, he may provide, provide us with some examples of how improved professionalism in the security sector has delivered better citizen security. He also, based on um, the recent study he did with Dr. Joe Siegel here at the Africa Center, will speak a bit about um, the fact that African security sector professionals are not only satisfied with their profession, but have a strong sense of pride in embracing the values of professionalism. Um, yet, yet we see this surge of coups. So, so what are some of the key challenges hindering or adva and advancing professionalism, given that uh, there is a great sense of pride? And then finally, he'll talk as well about what African leaders can do now, um, particularly given that the Ibrahim Index of African Governance, other data sources show a shrinking trust of citizens in security forces, um, what, what can be done? So um, I will leave it to our two panelists. Um, we'll go to Dr. Emil first um, for 15 or 20 minutes to give his, his opening remarks. Dr. Emil. Assalamu alaikum. Bonjour tout le monde. Hello to all. Good morning et bon dia. Hello. Okay, merci et Kat, merci pour Thank you, Kat, for this lovely personne. introduction of et my je humble person. Ici et puis parler, I si ça pas. am going to sit here to speak Alors, to you, if that's all right. Je vais inviter peut-être euh, celle qui va manipuler les diapos là So, uh, if the person taking care un peu, of the slides oui. could... Uh, Qui répond au, au double clic. Could Donc, move them along. Aller, donc, très rapidement. Alors, comme l'a dit Kat, dans, so like dans, Kat said, dans la présentation, in her il y a exactement 15 ans de cela, j'étais assis là où vous êtes. One time was sitting where, 15 years ago, I was sitting where you are currently sitting, and I was a lieutenant colonel, and I just finished getting my master's in Afghanistan, and I was following this course with great interest. Puisque après ce cours. And uh, appreciation after this attente, class, I went home, and, all, and without expectation, I became minister, minister of security. And this training was so useful to me. Je peux aussi le vœu pour vous. And I can also 
pour aussi que vous soyez aujourd'hui à ces postes de responsabilité et pour comprendre pourquoi ce stage, il fallait le faire, il faut le faire. Et en tout cas, que Allah ouvre les portes de succès pour vous. Et je suis sûr, parce que je disais la même chose en 2019 ici, dans la salle, I was saying uh, the same thing uh, in 2019, uh, an Ivorian friend also became a minister donc, of stage, communications and information. So I, I promise you this, um, this seminar brings good luck. You will be called upon to, uh, to high levels of uh, responsibility. So, so, Kat m'a donné 15 à 20 minutes. So Kat has given me 15 to 20 minutes. It's a difficult dilemma because I'm going to speak, I'm going to build upon what has already been said. And so, in terms of what General Biram said yesterday, which was extremely important, it created the foundation for what I will say. In terms of what Kat spoke about, which is rule de of law, so important, what Joseph Siegel talked about on democracy, so important for this session sessions, also, you see retrouver. that uh, we are going to call upon what we learned in other vais, sessions uh, today, and I will be uh, synthesizing uh, these Alors, things. So very je, je quickly, I am going to go straight into the heart of the subject en and speak of military professionalism. What do we mean by that? I won't define it. That would take too je much time and it would not be so à, useful. Uh, but let's go to the principles. What are the principles of military Slide. professionalism? Okay. Slide. Ah, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, 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 so inversé. Oh, yes, the next uh, one, sorry. So sorry, the slides Go have gotten mixed one. up. Yes, so there's a problem. Donc, euh, les cinq, il y a, y a cinq grands principes. So there are five pas du tout main exhaustif. principles. Il faut retenir not... quand on parle de professionnalisme militaire. So in for military donc, de, professionalism. De subordination so des forces armées uh, à l'autorité de subordination of the military forces to civil authority. This has been précédent. mentioned quite a bit la, in the la preceding à de droit. Uh, sessions. Un principe, and of course the presence of a, a rule of law. Uh, 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 political neutrality. Clément, General Biram gave many examples upon that subject, on that principle. Une culture éthique uh, ethical and uh, uh, institutional donc, ethical culture, uh, of course, is uh, necessary. And these are uh, critical values to follow. So an army that uh, has to have operational capacity, that, but needs to have the needed qualities to undertake these operations with these principles. Okay, so these are the main principles that we can uh, be going forward on this subject. subject. Now, what we must des, keep in des, mind is that there are values associated des with these principles Donc, dans, and these values um, that are shown throughout the, the leadership presentations about the two generals, from the two generals yesterday. I will say first, discipline. discipline. You can't talk about a professional army without discipline. Integrity. You cannot have military leaders uh, or, or a defense and security forces that are professional without integrity. Honor. The, the sense of honor de serving de others, uh, the sense of sacrifice, duty, engagement, commitment. These are values that are attached to these An principles, principles and these create the professionalism that we need. So principles associated with values. And these values are very relevant to the military institution. Take a, a, a university professor or a nurse. They, they, don't, ha they don't have to make the sacrifice. The supreme sacrifice. They don't have to die for their duty. Uh, so there are other values. So the military institution is a particular institution with particular values. Uh, someone named Etienne said that there are characteristics of the values of the military institution mean that this is a, an uncommon and uh, institution that cannot be compared to others. So this is why we must pay particularly particular attention to uh, security and defense forces in this regard. Now, military professionalism and the democratic governance of the security sector. 
Ici, dans ce Now, que nous allons parler ce matin, what we're going to talk about today is there is the context of a democratic culture. That Francis says, I'm setting the scene. Uh, professionalism in, in an autocratic regime can be present in a communist system. It can be present as well. But now we're going to talk really about a democratic context. That's our topic. So we're not going to go beyond that setting. This is why most African nations uh, have adopted these values, these democratic values. We talked about this before. Uh, these are universal values, and these universal values must be set in their context, leur, they must be contextualized, and within the country where they exist, and this brings us back to the uh, issue of the defense and security forces. So we have constitutions, we have regulations, we have codes of conduct, uh, we have regional codes of conduct. ECOWAS had a code of conduct, has a code of conduct, it initiated in 2001. Yeah, there's countries like Mali, Guinea, that have codes of conduct, and it's really about uh, civil uh, military relationships and the fact that the military must remain professional. So these values, these principles, uh, they seem to come from elsewhere. They, they seem to come from the West. Um, however, within our African values, our old ancient empires, these values already existed within these kingdoms. So I want to talk about the empire of Mali. The first slide, sorry. So the, the, Mali, the, the Malian Empire, we had a king, uh, Sunjata Keita. He was the emperor of Mali, which was between uh, what is currently Mali until, until Guinea. So over there, he, he was a leader of several uh, a set of kingdoms that formed an empire. So people pledged allegiance to him. And he would say he had all these values, you know, loyalty, integrity, submission to the supreme sovereign leader. So all military chiefs would pledge allegiance to this emperor, uh, Sujata, son of Sogon. Now, uh, I will take this kingdom. I recognize you as my sovereign, my tribe, and I uh, will come between your hands. It will be between your hands. I salute you. Uh, supreme leader. So this is the pledging of allegiance, and this is between since the 11th century. So this existed long before the, the Western world influenced us. These are values that are very ancient. And so uh, prior to colonialism, there were these empires, and and these values were there. There was a deterioration following this between the uh, relations between between the civilians and the military. So this is why I'm going to talk about governance of the security sector during this session, because when we implement security policies, we must, we absolutely need institutions and mechanisms for oversight, because it is a pillar. Of, uh, the oversight is a pillar of democracy. Uh, bad governance exists in autocracy, but if security forces safe Guard the people, the safeguard the, the state, but who safeguards the, the, the military? The security and defense forces has my friend Matt, um, who used to be at ACSS, who, who watches the guards, who guards the guards. Uh, this is, you know, there are a lot of issues. You can see in a country, which has been mentioned before, where the democratic oversight of military and defenses, uh, if we have an effective oversight, you have good civil military relations, where you have pluralism, this works. 
So there are, I'm not going to name any particular countries because some countries have made a lot of progress. Uh, but the countries that apply this oversight of the security and defense forces are countries where democracy is progressing and, and they are developing. On the other hand, countries that don't respect this, that don't abide by this, and that tasted the bitter fruit of coup d'etats, like my country, Burkina Faso, uh, with a coup that succeeded, will, I think, come back to this topic. So it's a vicious cycle, and, and it's impossible, or nearly impossible, to get out of this vicious cycle. Uh, but you'll see countries like Nigeria and Ghana that had coup d'etats were able to professionalize their military and come out of this vicious cycle. But this was a very... Um, long process. It started in, in the 1980s. And Obasanjo said, we have to professionalize the military forces. Uh, we have to have the, the governors then, you know, they made them not military. So, because originally they thought they needed the military leaders to ensure discipline within the states. And then those who had juicy contracts, uh, oil contracts, uh, that, you know, so they were put aside and the army became professionalized and now represent a, a very strong support for democracy in Nigeria. So my, the second question about civil military relationships, relations, I'm not going to go too long on that because we obviously already had a session on this. Uh, so I won't spend too much time, but I want to emphasize it, you know, there are uh, histories. We have had histories that have always been tumultuous since independence. Uh, in Africa. So, you know, states have had to defend their forces to defend their territories after the, after the independence, and they played key roles in the creation of nation states. So, you know, to create the strongest institutions. This is also the origin of many coup d'etats in, Af in Africa. The strongest institutions within these states were armies after the independence, and that's why these, the military thought that played a key role, and, and they continue to play this key role, but now let's do the a, a review of, of what's happened. So this shows um, what's the result of this. We've had a, more than 106 coup d'etats uh, that were successful and 104 that were not successful. So that's close to 200 coups So when you see on this graph, since 1960, the, the successful and unsuccessful coup d'etats are almost overlapping. The successful coup d'etats, there were a greater number at one point. Uh, but during the Cold War, we saw that coup d'etats became less successful simply because there were two camps, two sides uh, in the Cold War. And each was trying to keep its space, uh, each side of that war was trying to keep its space. Now there is growth since, nine, uh, there is actually a, a downward trend since the 1960s in terms of coup d'etats. Now the second slide, the next slide, we're going to go very quickly. <laughs> So, so this is the situation for, so you see Sudan is the first country, uh, the champion of coup d'etats, and this continues. It's unfortunate. And so West Africa is very well represented, and Burkina Faso is the champion of West Africa, of successful coup d'etats. I mean, there's never been a one that's missed. They, they always succeed in my country. That's uh, really unfortunate. Uh, this is, this is extremely important. Now you see Egypt is not represented, but uh, the first coup d'etat in the world took place in Egypt 400 years before Jesus Christ uh, during the Pharaoh. Era. 
the so it was in, in Africa, in Egypt, so uh, 1952, and then there was the coup d'état in 1952 against uh, King Farouk. Uh, and carried out by young Africa officers. That's premier, a whole other story. Non, so Africa Donc, is pas, number one in pas, terms of coup d'état in, in the world. Mais so this is not by chance. Now, what explains this, especially in West Africa? De vraiment, comme je so ici, West Africa is 44% uh, of coup d'états in Africa took place in West Africa. And the majority are in Francophone countries. Africa, de la Sierra Leone, uh, et bien avant de professionnaliser leur armée. Uh, Ghana, de plus en plus, donc, de ce, de, de ce Sierra Leone are actually voilà, moving donc, away from this phenomenon. So, de, 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 de since 2019, we've donc, had a resurgence coup coup of coup d'etats. And so you see that the latest ones were donc, in Africa, Guinea-Bissau. Uh, which is a Lusophone country, and uh, it's really, the, and it was unsuccessful, but it's the Francophone countries that really dominate uh, this pit parade, essentially. It's unfortunate and sad. And I think we'll have a good discussion about this. I, I will ask you, why is this happening in West Africa? And why is it more specifically in Francophone Africa? And these are questions. I mean, this is the reality. I don't have an answer to this question. We're going to have to discuss what the reasons are. Now, Article 1 of the Additional Protocol on Democracy and Good Governance of ECOWAS is, is, you know, there are a lot of mechanisms, there are a lot of rules within ECOWAS. These stipulate that all access to power must be through free elections that are honest and transparent and anti-constitutional changes of power are forbidden uh, or any other illegal way of accessing power. So ECOWAS uh, has set out an answer to, to this issue Now, very quickly, what are the causes that are raised by the military, that are proposed by the military as to what, why this happens, to stay in power? For the military, it is... Uh, particularly, they often bring up the decline of the prestige of the political parties. Now, when we talk about this decline of the prestige of political parties, I, when uh, President Akufuado uh, gave his speech uh, during the opening session, de l'ouverture donc de ce séminaire. We, Il a cité le cas du Ghana day, où nous avons 79% du taux de participation. Uh, of the population participated vraiment une fierté, une fierté in the elections. La de, les dernières élections en France, le taux de participation because originally it was 63%. So, you know, you know, and this was in, in France, so it's, you know, 79% is huge. I, I, so, Africa within certain countries, there is a resurgence of democracy, and Ghana is a good example. Uh, so, you know, the, the fragmentation uh, the, the, the fragmentation of the civil political elite, uh, the contagion effect of coup d'etats in other countries. Uh, you know, there's young people are carrying this out. There are a lot of young people, and there's a lot. They're touched by <coughs> social media, etc. So this is a, a new trend we must look at. And often, uh, these people have, uh, they communicate uh, they've been to the same schools. So uh, and social difficulties also uh, are reflected uh, because of the poor governance in terms of the security sector and uh, the violation of the Constitution also. The President of Ghana told us in his speech that there are 13 uh, African presidents who have uh, extended their legal mandates 
adopter la limitation des mandats. Mais on a que 20 adopted, qui respectent ces engagements. Donc, uh, cela nous fait donc, uh, vraiment le banning de faire so. des partis uniques en Afrique. Et donc, certains pays sont encore en train d'avoir une partie politique et c'est très dangereux. Donc, dans 5 minutes, je vais essayer de décider que la Constitution, c'est une culture constitutionnelle, mais qui est une culture constitutionnaliste. J'aime bien cette citation, c'est pour le plan de l'Université de la Santé Ivoirienne. La Constitution est le cœur du gouvernement constitutionnel, mais que... And it's so important, uh, it's a bit of a paraphrase, but the constitution without a constitutional cultural is only going to be the ruin of constitutionality. There are other factors, but we're not going to delve into them. We are going to continue with in terms of the role of external actors. Now, the confiscation of the democratic process and the totalitarianism. What is the impact of coup d'etats on the professionalism of the armed forces? We have to recognize that these coup d'etats really have a negative impact on the countries and on the security of the country. First, uh, the uh, uh, violation of, of the Constitution, and then young people. Les supérieurs qui sont là, qu'est-ce qu'il faut en faire La rupture du chaîne de commandement, le nivellement par le bas. Essayez donc de mettre tous ces officiers à la retraite. La cristallisation des rivalités dans les différents pays. Vous connaissez bien les supérieurs dans les équipes militaires. Armes, branches de l'armée, les forces, 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 les et les clans même dans les parlements de sécurité sont les forces de sécurité. Et donc, finalement, et pour le tout ça, le manque de stratégie d'exemple. Ils prennent le pouvoir, mais comment quitter le pouvoir de l'État Et ça, ça devient un problème de problème dans la religion de l'élection des problèmes. Voilà pourquoi les Nations Unies ont pensé qu'il faut absolument que les pays ne puissent respecter cette norme de choses. Renforcer la démocratie. Et renforcer la démocratie, il faut absolument And to do so, you need the participation of the people. You cannot exclude the people. You have to respect the constitution. You have to have open and free elections. You have to have leaders that are accepted and chosen by the people. You need good governance. You need transparency. You need equity. You need the reinforcement of arbitration to resolve conflicts. And what I Going to finish by speaking of the importance of having a national security policy to improve, to improve, uh, to strengthen the processes of uh, security in the country. This must be anchored within the vision and the policy of the country. And before this happens, you, one must know that we can, in putting this national security strategy in place, we have to intervene on the following. Dépolitiser donc so we have to depoliticize the military environment, institutionalize, and, this, and, 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 and put into place mechanisms within the armed forces, forces to have checks and balances, um, reinforce the responsibilities and the uh, professionalism, the de, 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 education de, 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 de and training of the military. And now the strategy of national, the national security strategy will allow us to move forward very quickly in the professionalism of the armed forces. In 2018, a study was undertaken. Dr. Luca was a part of the study. That reviewed the status quo the of, of, the, the, of, of the 10 African countries in the security sector, and, and we realized that these, these African countries had no vision, they had no national security strategy. In this study, it was shown that there is no coherence between the security, there was no security strategy. For the armed forces. So first, you have to have a vision that is crucial, critical. And this is why many countries have undertaken the development, the elaboration of a national security strategy since 2014. And um, Ghana just published its national security strategy in 2020, and I think this is a great trend. So what is the use of this strategy and the purpose? I believe... 
Donc, le dernier élément qui montre que les participants ne peuvent permettre donc de rapidement provisionner les forces armées sont les suivants. D'abord, dans la salle de sécurité nationale, on redéfinit une vision plus large de la sécurité nationale. Vous avez vu ici, dès la première session, nous avons parlé des tendances. Vous ne pouvez pas parler de mégatrends. Tu peux, vous ne pouvez pas parler de sécurité si vous ne prenez pas en compte tous ces éléments donc la sécurité. Alors qu'avant, la politique de sécurité était beaucoup plus sectorielle. Plutôt désir pour un combat entre États et pas pour des combats internes. Et il n'y uh, a pas de problème dans le chômage, uh, de problème dans le chômage, 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 de problème dans quand on arrive à travers un processus de sécurité, de la voie de stratégie de sécurité nationale, on a une cohésion entre le peuple, le gouvernement et la voie de gouvernement. C'est un processus qui permet donc de faire cette chose. Ensuite, le renforcement d'efficacité et la voie de sécurité. Vous voyez donc à travers l'élaboration de la stratégie de sécurité nationale, ça donne des résultats claires, des précisions sur les rôles, la mission, le mandat, le mandat et les de différents uh, uh, aller donc, um, euh, vers uh, cette stratégie de uh, uh, enfin, la stratégie de 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 la stratégie It allows uh, better governance, having better checks and balances, uh, uh, ensuring democracy and the respect of civil liberties and uh, human rights. And I do thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil, for a very comprehensive presentation. There um, uh, are a lot of things to unpack here. The five major principles of military professionalism, um, coming back to that age-old question, uh, really age-old, as you showed us, um, who guards the guardians? Um, but then also um, what you've said here to set us up this afternoon to discuss national security strategy development is quite interesting. Why there's an interest in doing that so as to further advance professionalism um, in African countries on the continent. So I'm sure uh, this was very rich. We'll come back to a lot of these principles and um, these pieces of the puzzle. Uh, for the moment, I would like to move on to Dr. Kwesi Anning. Um, we'll give you uh, 15 or 20 minutes of the floor here to give us your presentation, which I think will follow on really well um, from Emile's, um, and then we'll move into question and answer. So Dr. Anning, welcome. We're glad to have you by Zoom, um, and please proceed. And thank you very much, Catherine, and certainly my brother, Emile. So what is the context within which we are talking about professionalism of the statutory security forces? And I think I will take a slightly counterfactual approach uh, to this conversation. One is that whatever has led to the reversals in Guinea, Burkina Faso, Mali is happening across all West African countries. That the reversals that we are seeing in terms of democracy are deepening and they will continue to expand. And that expansion is not only because of terrorism and violent extremism. It's not only because of maritime insecurity and the embedded transnational organized crimes, but is the nature of the state itself and the levels of collusion and corruption that creates an enabling environment for disaffection against politics. And the, and the democratic system of, of, of governance. Across the sub-region, we are seeing the usage of electoral violence, deep fake uh, disinformation, and corruption as conduits to power. We are seeing the manner in which natural resource exploitation and the deliberate distortion in its distribution becomes a tool for control, for access, and for punishment. The end result is that we are seeing societies 
of exclusion, of victimhood, and of dispossession. Underpinning all this is the dramatic demographic expansions or growth on planned urban expansion, unemployment, resulting in an increasing incapacity of the state and its law enforcement agencies to provide security. Next slide. So how do we deal with this in terms of professionalizing the institutions that we have who are mandated by the constitution to provide security? And I think if we look at the status right now, First is that we have a mixed status of professionalism on the continent due to varying levels of institutional implementation. First, in terms of developing the statutory security forces, and Emil spoke eloquently about oversight institutions. And here, I want to spend 30 seconds. We have countries where the Parliamentary Committees on Defense, Security, and Interior are incompetent to speak about issues of military professionalism. The end result is that these conversations are politicized, they are personalized, and issues of professionalism become a tool for control. So part of the challenges of security sector governance and reform processes in transitional countries. And here I'm talking about Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and shows this mixed status of professionalism. And from where I sit, where we train about 1,500 officers annually for peacekeeping, people have passed out for 20 years and they've never had any training. So that raises fundamental questions about the five or six original points that Emil put up. How do states consistently seek to improve the professionalism of their statutory security forces so that they can deliver on their mandate? Two, relates to the excessive executive oversight of security sector institutions that have been politicized, that have been threatened, that have resulted in the weakening of professionalism, independence, and institutional ethos. And here, I think Ghana, Togo, Benin, Niger, uh, and Uganda are clear cases. And I'm sure we may be able to throw in Burkina Faso, Guinea, and even Mali. But we are also seeing excessive militarization plus securitization of the political systems, weakening the oversight of the sector itself. So we have the institutions that must play the oversight roles, themselves corrupt, professionally incompetent, incapable of delivering oversight responsibilities and functions away from executive control. So that more often than not, Parliament and its oversight institutions only become an extension of the desires and expectations of the executive. But of course, there's no doubt at all, I think Emil mentioned this, that peacekeeping and peace support operations continue to serve as critical contributions to security sector professionalism, A, in terms of the exchange of ideas, in terms of the networks, getting access to new logistics, but also being provided with the training to be able to operate in complex operational en environments. And I think here, Rwanda, Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal um, are key countries in which peacekeeping has played a very critical role in ensuring that professionalism at least is maintained. Next slide. The narrative and the rhetoric 
in our democratizing and democratized states. It's about moving the populations from being spectators of the political processes to being citizens with rights, responsibilities, expectations, and of loyalty to the state and its statutory security forces. Unfortunately, in the last two to three years, we are seeing a declining trust of citizens, not so much in the security forces per se, but in the manner in which these institutions have allowed the political class to deliberately manipulate their performance and their delivery of security to citizens. So here, the broader question that we need to discuss amongst ourselves is how can we insulate the statutory security forces from excessive political interventions and manipulation that results in the issuance of orders by the political class that sometimes goes against the ethos of the military's professionalism. And this is across the sub uh, region. So one is the theoretical conversations about professionalizing the, the armed forces. The second is the caliber of the political class who have executive control and oversight as to how the military or the security forces must work. So we are seeing across the sub-region an excessive involvement of the military in internal security and civilian affairs that must routinely be left either to the police or to other non-military forces. Two, we are seeing an increasingly ethnicized and biased recruitment and promotions within statutory security forces. And this also cuts across. And that then results in a lack of accountability and a worsening culture of impunity. Now, in situations where impunity does, does take place, respect for the rule of law, human rights, and by extension, the respect for the constitution begins to be undermined. More often than not, the political class tends to separate manipulating and undermining military professionalism away from that eventual undermining of the constitutional process. So my argument is simple. To deepen the professionalism of the statutory security forces, we need to deepen the knowledge and professionalism of the political masterclass. We cannot and we must not separate the two. Otherwise, the disconnect and the misfits will continue and the threats to first the professionalism and by extension constitutional order will continue. But we are also seeing how counterterrorism operations are resulting in violations at the community level. And let me state it and say it very bluntly. Counter extremism or counterterrorism operations have become a business in a lot of our countries. It has very little to do with an objective assessment of what the threat is, but more about creating a sense of fear that leads to the disbursement of resources that hardly ever reaches places where the supposed threat is coming from. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? And this, I've rolled this into a number of the points that I've been talking about. What can leaders do? 
I think first and foremost, we need accountable, transparent, democratic governance. And here, this is more a political decision process in which those who willingly offer themselves to lead must at least make an effort to learn. But we are seeing situations where we have parliamentary committees on intelligence, on security, on interior, whose collective knowledge of the issues at stake are at best weak and at worst non-existent. And I can give the example of Ghana, where a deputy minister of defense appeared before parliament and could not mention one single rank in the army, couldn't mention a single rank in the police service, but parliament nevertheless approved this person to become a deputy minister of defense. Now, when you do that, you send a signal to Emil, who has served for 30 years to salute this character. And I think it raises concerns about the objectivity and the professionalism, not so much of the, of the uniform the statutory, uniform. but more about the capacity of the political class to provide that leadership, that guidance, and that operational strategic you know, guidance that we are looking for. Second relates to continuous processes of responsive, objective, and accountable reforms. Now, when we talk about reforms, what do I mean here? We are seeing investments in the uniformed forces that do not speak to the objective threats that they are facing. And the, and the rhetorical flourishes from the political side creates a clear impression of a disjoint between what the uniformed forces need, what their understanding is, and what is being provided. And this lacunae must be great. Okay. Security sector investments must be linked to economic growth and of course also to development. Fourth, the need to build credible, strong democratic institutions and mechanisms for governance must be key. Okay. More often than not, we talk about security sector reform. What are we reforming? From where to what? What is it that the reform must achieve? You know, so the rhetoric from political leaders about coup d'etats, about unconstitutionalism, raises particular challenges because it is a failure of political leadership when they don't have the gumption to tell their brother heads of states when they start to fiddle with the constitutions. Emil spoke about the African Charter on Democracy, the West African Charter on Good Governance. Our leaders are incapable of cracking the whip so that these protocols, conventions, regulations, and decisions are useful, but they are not being used. And therein lies the processes that undermines you know, constitutional, uh, constitutionalism. But of course, over the last two decades, there's an increase in civil society engagement and an improved knowledge as to how security sector governance must take place. And here I picked it from my friend Joe about improving professional military education to advance professionalism. But we need to, to disaggregate this. What does it mean? What is the context or the content? And how do we make it context specific? But there's no doubt at all that PMEs under proper leadership, strong, independent, intellectually savvy leadership can instill a commitment to democratic civil military relations and citizen security. 
Unfortunately, citizen security is now located at a very small place. Shaping strategic vision, advancing understanding of national and regional security strategy, and enhancing an institutional ethos. Before I come to my last point, I want to talk about the National Security Strategy Agreement or process in Ghana. Yes, we have a document, but less than 5% of the uniformed forces, one, have heard about this document, and two, have seen it and have read what is inherent in the document. And this is two and a half years ago since the document was written. So I think we need to move away from fancy rhetorical flourishes about developing a document that does not speak to the objective reality of the threats that states are facing, simply to be able to say we have a document. That document has neither clarified the operational decision-making as to whether the National Security Council is an operational instrument or it is a council in which different institutions are members and can take decisions respective to that particular institution's capacity to undertake a particular operation. That document has also opened the space in which people have said, I'm from national security, I'm doing this without political oversight. So one is to have that document. The second is to say, to what extent are those who need to use that document conversant with the content predicated on shared national values, shared norms, and shared principles? And therein lies the weakness of the Ghana National Security Strategy document. Finally, I think leaders must be bold enough to implement policies and programs that strengthens and prioritizes institutional efficiency of parliaments and the judiciary. But we know that they are not. I can cite one or two countries where those who sit on the intelligence committees of parliament themselves have come through into parliament, resigned their positions under very dubious circumstances. We cannot ask the uniformed forces to be professional when those who play the oversight roles and control their best strengths themselves are unprofessional and don't seek to play by the rules of the game. I will end my initial comments here and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anning, um, for this uh, elaborate presentation. Um, very, very comprehensive about um, different trends in the development of um, relationships between citizens in the security sector, these different levels of trust, um, varied levels of implement institutional implementation of SSR, executive oversight of the security sector, politicization of institutions, all leading to this mixed status that we see across the continent in terms of professionalism. Thank you also for um, your uh, extensive list of ideas about um, where responses could go to further advance professionalism. I think um, this point that we need professionalism not only within the security sector, but also with the, amongst the civilians who are providing the oversight is a point um, certainly well taken within the room and something that we've definitely been discussing in our discussion groups daily after some of our other sessions as well. So thank you for um, presenting us with these thoughts and suggestions about where to go next, uh, policy-wise, program-wise, and otherwise.